Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Business of Property. I'm your host, Cheryl Leon from Property Development Australia. How are we doing, everyone out and about? It's um, I've lost track of how many days we've been in lockdown, but I hope you're doing okay. And 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 this this is probably hopefully the highlight of your week in the property property world. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our special guest, um, Jane Slack Smith, who is the founder of Your Property Success and also Investors Choice Mortgages. Um, this incredible woman is a property market commentator. She's an educator, an author, a podcaster, uh, so down to earth. Um, really, really so excited to have her share a bit of her knowledge around renovation and how we can gain equity and pay for your development cost through renovation, which is really quite exciting for the property nerds like myself out there. So I'd love to invite Jane down to the stage. Jane, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Here in Melbourne, so uh, yep, all good here. I know we're all, we're all about the same. It's it's the the conversation of just so how's lockdown for you and how long have you been in lockdown? You know, it used to be how's the weather, but you know that's that's the way we roll these days. Well, but thank you for for joining us, Jane. I I, I love that you've had such a breadth uh, breadth of and depth of experience in property but more so you've been educating people around the renovation space and we want to be able to talk about how we can you know sometimes people sort of look at renovation and they're like oh it's is it development but it is it's a form of development but how can we gain equity i mean um through renovation to be able to unlock it for bigger developments i think that's the thing that we want to talk about today Absolutely. And look, I have to say, you know, when you approached me a couple of months ago and I was like, yeah, yeah, I can I can talk about this. This is great. I can add so much value. And then on the weekend, I think I messaged you. I was uh, doing some research. I thought I just want to, you know, add as much value as possible to uh, where the people are in, in the group. And I was, I think it was, was a Jack going and I'm going to have a billion dollar business and I've done $200 million. And then I looked at you, I think, you know, your post your deals this week. And I was just like, oh my God, these guys are so so good you know and I know when I started investing I was in groups um I don't know if anyone out there do you guys remember Summersoft in like 2000 yes. 2001 yes, yeah. little, um Jay Oh, Jane Summers, yeah, Summers. So, yes, yes, she's like my idol. I had her on my podcast and I was like so excited. Oh, wow, um, but uh. And, you know, but I used to lurk on there because I thought, oh, you know, I'm not worthy to put my projects up or do what I, you know, big plans are. And uh, it's interesting when I was, I was looking at this, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to step this up. So you're not only getting, going to get my thoughts on renovation and how you can actually, you know, pay for some of the development costs. Yes. I really want to share with you some information on demographics because uh, it turns out we have a love of spreadsheets. So I want to throw you my algorithm Same. and show you how that works. And, uh, yeah, talk about some of the success that I've seen over the last educating people in property over the last 15 years or so and uh, what I think is is uh, makes a true successful investor. So lots yeah. of things to come. Fantastic. I can't I can't wait. But tell us a little bit about yourself, Jane. How did you get into sure. the property space? And I'm sure oh I have little people joining us today. Hello. <laughs> um well, my, my family's been told not to come into the attic. So you know yes. it, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um <laughs> look, I uh you know, Dubbo girl, grew up on a farm. Um, my dad was a farm labourer. And, uh, you know, I had to kind of get a scholarship to get to uni. I think my parents wrote like hundreds of letters and I got a scholarship to do mining engineering, of all things. And uh, I, uh, the day that I started uh, mining uh, engineering or started my first mine, all the miners went on strike. There'd never been a female work underground legally before in Australia. So it was all pretty exciting. And um, I then became an explosives expert. So, you know, uh, worked in with explosives for about 20 years. So everything was about risk assessment. So cause and effect, consequence and likelihood. And when I met my now husband, Todd, you know, 21 years ago, he's like this, you know, property investing, you know, we, we should kind of consider this. I've got a property in New Zealand, and but I thought I had to pay it off. And so for me, it was like, 
And my boss used to keep saying, get a mortgage because when you have a mortgage, I know you're tied to me forever. And I'm like, I'm never having a mortgage. And uh, and I thought, well, I should be able to hack this. If there's 16,565 suburbs in Australia, there should be 10 to 20 years worth of data that I can understand and work out what suburbs characteristics allowed some suburbs to outperform others. And so I looked at the data, I looked at uh, how I could minimise the risk and making sure there was an on tap rental demand, I could look at uh, growth and looking at pricing pressures. So I modelled it all out. Uh, we bought our first property here in Melbourne. Um, I bought my first property for $425,000 and I only had a $45,000 deposit. I had to borrow uh, personal loan $50,000 for renovation and six nine months later it was valued at $700,000. So wow. I pulled that cash out and my husband did the property next door went to sydney and did it again and did it again and did it again and we bought between 2001 and 2006 and then went well that's enough and i was like okay i've got to teach my friends and family and so i taught them and they grew multi-million dollar portfolios and i thought i need new friends and the only way i could get professional liability insurance was starting a mortgage broking business which i thought yeah, was like right. music car salesman and i was like what and um, so I started that and I won Australia's Mortgage Broker of the Year a couple of times and it was all about the property, how to give people the research and understanding of how to build a portfolio to be able to have the freedom of do, to do what they want, when they want, with who they want so they could create intergenerational change. In 2012, I wrote a book and uh, uh, met up with the co-founder of the uh, your uh, your property success ultimate guide to renovation course um, that we developed John Hubbard and he had he was a video expert but it had been flipping properties and created some really interesting ways of doing that and um, yeah we got together it was going to be an easy job 170 hours of filming later we had the course <laughs> and uh, yeah so that's that's it so I think I think the filming and I've done a little bit of filming for a course and after like four hours of filming you sort of go oh, I know goodness, how much energy is that sort of <laughs> the I smiling the, and and I think that's probably one of the hardest bits of the the the, the journey there um <laughs> Pete, Pete is saying I need new friends to help love it hey um, Pete know you <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Must be early, early in the morning mm. in the in the UK. Um, so thank you for joining. And and so if, well, why renovations? And I mean, I've was, obviously you've been through mm. all sorts of different cycles and all of that. Yeah, um, I, renovations were a way that I could hack and manufacture growth. So I might just um, share my screen so that you guys can have a look at this. And I'm gonna play my video when I can do that so it doesn't look too ugly okay so so one of the things that uh, can you see that okay absolutely perfect so one of the things that was really important to me being so low risk that I just thought I was going to get it wrong so I thought how can I minimize my risk by not losing my forty five thousand dollars age 28 thought you know that was the biggest amount of money I'd ever see and uh and I decided to de-risk and the way that I did it was actually come up with a plan a b and c to uh, try to make money on every deal so you know the premise premise just being a working assumption until it's proven to be a irrefutable rule so my first premise was that if I buy in a growing area and I can add value to it will add value to the property. So capital growth was important to me. And I had 10 years worth of data that allowed me to have a look at the growth areas and the growth patterns. Um, premise two was, you know, if I could create a higher and better use of a property, I was going to get a higher rent and I'd get, get a retire, higher return when I sold the property. Now, you guys do a higher and better return when you walk out the back of a property and you're interested in what's in the backyard. I was interested in what was in the, in the front of the property. Um, so, you know, some people do that through granny flats. Some people do that through you know, the, the multi-res strategy, but it was actually about manufacturing in the short-term growth mm. and uh, equity. And then the premise three was research and knowledge will give you leverage in accessing the property and buying below the market. So I wanted the money now. Now, this is the only premise that isn't a, a rule that you can follow all the time because obviously in a fast-moving market, it is difficult. However, you know, I've got 
mentoring students at the moment, um, working with buyers agents around the country, one in, in Melbourne, the buyer's agent essentially said, you know, it's a deceased estate, you can get it for, you know, a million and fifty would, would buy this, but put a one in front of it. They went back with a 950 and went, you know, I've got so much work, yeah, just take it. So, you know, even in markets right mm -hmm. at the moment, there's lazy agents, right? So there's an opportunity to uh, to buy below the market, even when we think it, it's impossible. Yeah. So, so what I want to concentrate on, and this is kind of funny, Cheryl. This came up in my Facebook feed this week, and it was an image from 2012. So wow. now look at your little pink cheeks and all. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, nine years ago, and it was, I think it was in Money Magazine or Australian Property Investor Magazine, but it was around these top tips and myths. And I was looking at it going, geez, if you get it right, nothing changes, right? The tips are still relevant still today. Yeah. So I thought I'd run through just those tips and show you which ones that I thought that I could really pull out and add value um, to your audience this evening. And the first one is around having a goal. And, and that is about being really firm and understanding the end result that you want and the current reality that you're at, the resources and the ability to gain knowledge or have people to allow you and assist you and the funding that you've got to get and bridge that gap. Now, you know, I'll get into this a bit later, but this is probably one of the standout biggest things that I find most property investors miss. And I've, I've educated thousands and thousands of investors. So, you know, I, I see this in the strategy course of my mortgage clients. I've seen it in the Ultimate Guide to Renovation course, you know, uh, students. I've seen it monthly in calls of the Q&A calls we've had for the last eight years in your Property Success Club. So, you know, I talk to a lot of people and I probably, I'd say this is probably the biggest lapse when it comes down to making money from property. Um, the next thing is around growth. And, you know, for a buy and hold strategy, which is my strategy, unlike the development strategy often, you know, it was about being in an in-demand area that has the characteristics to go up in value. So I wanted to make sure that there was actually capacity for the area to go up in value, but also the property. And most people don't understand that there needs to be pricing disparity within the suburb so that when you do a renovation and you spend your money, you're going to make at least $2 for every dollar you spend. And you can quickly find that information out and I can show you where that is in a moment. The other thing is to understand the demographics. You know, I am an absolute student and I would I probably access census data three or four times a week like i am mm -hmm. in census all the time and as the further we get away from you know 2016 i get anxious about when's the next data coming so i'm so excited we've just got the new data we have to wait a year for it but understanding what your market wants who they are and uh having a product that they want is just vital and i'm going to show you how i do that as well and then obviously rise the property to a higher and better use. So this is a strategic renovation. Every property that you see could possibly do with a lick of paint and a bit of a touch up, but they don't all deserve it. And most of them won't be able to make a profit for you. Still the same tips today as I used 20 years ago. And, you know, I, I taught in the book uh, 12 years ago, um, nine years ago. So finance is the fuel. I'm not going to get into the, that this time. Um, finance is the fuel. You know, that's about getting the leverage to allow you to be structured for your vision and just, you know, simple. Um, and, I, you know, I coach other mortgage brokers who uh, my mentoring clients are working with. And, you know, just one last year alone, you know, we looked at how the lending was being structured. We came back and gave an alternative. I coached that mortgage broker on how to do it. And the gentleman saved $20,000 a year on a 30-year loan just by having the structuring difference. Mm. So that was the cash flow advantage. But obviously there's the glass ceiling that we all face at some stage in servicing. And uh, being able to just squeeze the last dollars out of that is uh, really important. So spreading risk, et cetera. And then keeping your cash. You know, equity allows you to leapfrog. So I'm... I'm you know, I put my first $45,000 into the property. Unfortunately, 25000 went in stamp duty, 5% um, deposit, and the rest uh, of my properties have been bought with equity. So I've never used any more of my cash. So that's a, a blessing that, you know, mm -hmm. most people could have. So 
So yeah, so that's that's kind of um, you know the the top tips. But you know, for the point, because I I don't want to you know lead people astray with the topic that I promised to talk to. You know, I really think strategic renovations are are always asking about the higher and better use. And you know, what does your demographic want? You know, if you're in, um, you know, western suburbs, then you know maybe that's not a granite you know, bench top. You know, maybe it's around having security bars on your walls. I don't know. Terrible generalization, having grown up in Dubbo. But you know, it's kind of um, it's around understanding what the market wants, who they are, and what it bears. And often, you know, what I will do is for every 10 properties I inspect to buy, I will look at, you know, about eight of those are the properties that are target properties I'm after. Two of those properties are ones that have been renovated to a higher standard. I want to mm -hmm. see what fixtures and fittings are being used. And two, for every 10 properties I look at, I look at one or two rental properties. And that's when you learn so much. And you, you are hearing the tenant saying, oh, but it doesn't have a... You know, they never say, you know, TV in the bathroom. It's, it's more like, you know, I can't see the kids from the, from the, um, mm -hmm. when I'm washing up. Or, you know, carpet's just going to, you know, get grotty with the dogs. And so you're kind of listening to what they want. But over the years, you know, and with the renovations that we've done, the number one thing is street appeal. You can lose people in the first 30 seconds. So making sure that you've, you've nailed the street appeal and this goes for developers as well you know understanding you know what that looks like and you know even if you think about defense housing australia when they started deploying their people into large developments and they would spread them out you know hoping there'd be an integration into um, the community you could always tell a dha property because they had not uh sheets similar to this, sheets on the windows, but they had curtains and they had landscaped, you know, grounds. Mm. And, you know, it just it, it just adds so much value. Obviously, as we all know, kitchens and bathrooms, like it's a no-brainer. You're going to yeah. get your money back with those if you don't overcapitalise. And as, you know, most of your um, listeners obviously know, yeah. the kitchen yeah. might be double the size of the bathroom, but the bathroom probably costs as much. But, you um, you know, there's uh, it's definitely an investment that's well worth uh, taking. And I think one of the cheapest investments you can make is paint you know, and painting, you know, uh, internally and externally and making it light and bright and then staging the property. And I've staged properties to just get the valuer to be able to see the property the way that I see it and, you know, add some value there. So I'm always aiming for $2 back for every dollar I spend, Cheryl. And Jane, so with your personal strategy is it has predominantly been buy and hold, buy, renovate, Absolutely. and hold. Yeah, cosmetic renovations and buy and hold. Uh, the only property which actually upset me that we ended up getting rid of was a beachfront um, unit on Campbell Parade, uh, mm -hmm. older style property. And about it was six years ago, you know, there was conversations around concrete cancer and we're going to have to throw in about $100,000 each. Um, and we spoke to our agent and said, how much value would this 100000 add? Because most of it was structural work. And it's like, like 20 or 30 grand because of the, the paint job. And they only started work this year and they're up to about three to $400,000 per unit. And, you know, we, we sold that. We went to the agent and, you know, always do good. Went to the agent and said, look, this has got a lot of pain ahead. I, if you've got a developer who someone that understands mm -hmm this is like i'd rather take a hit of a hundred thousand and and make sure that you know the people who are buying this are buying this with the full disclosure of what's happening so it's the only property i've ever sold yeah right and and so and that because you mentioned that you were also looking at properties that are for sale but for rent because i i typically would think okay if i'm going to renovate and because you know we're in the development world we're generally selling like i i instinctively think okay buy renovate sell and so the whole point of going all right well we're actually catering for a rental market mm. also needs to be able to help determine what you're doing what sort of renovations and what scale and and not, not overcapitalizing 
And, and that's the secret, understanding what to spend and if there's capacity in the suburb for you to then go forward and do extra research to see if there is a pricing disparity between the unrenovated and renovated. Mm -hmm. And I can show you really quickly how I would do that. So, for instance, you know, most people here, I'm sure, have RP data. Yeah. If I was, I'd just, you know, generate very quickly a, a, a very simple suburb profile. And this is the, the quickest way I can do is to just get my eye in to see if there's some capacity here. And, you know, it basically says the median price is 615000 the 25 percentile price is 554. The 75 percentile price is 690. Now, I always try to buy below the median and renovate to a standard just above the median, but it needs to have capacity. Mm -hmm. And the way that I would do that really quickly is I'd say, okay, 615 plus 10 percent for a cosmetic renovation, 60 grand, and I want to make 60 grand back as profit. So I need this number here to be below 735 and it's not now that means that i can either have to buy a lot lower than the median which is difficult in lower price suburbs or you know i could go to another area so this is granville for instance i do the same exercise just to see if i can you know and this is just a, a rough rule of thumb so that i can just see if i need to go and do more research in the suburb mm -hmm. start with 840 you know, 10% renovation, 84,000, 10% profit, you know, a million and eight, yep, it's below, below a million and 85, then I'd start and go and do the research in that suburb. So just some, some, a little tip for you to be able to see, you know, how you could, you know, potentially do that. Yeah, that's a really quick assessment there. And like yeah, I said, I it's mean, just we know the, like it harder, but sometimes yeah. you just need a 10,000 foot view to go, am I going to really spend all my time in this suburb? Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you just because I got really scared on seeing how advanced your people were <laughs> in the group, um, how how we would take this to the next level um, as well. So, you know, when I talk about and, and when I have, um, you know, taught the Ultimate Guide to Renovation course, I've always, I've had so many students come back and a lot of them have been developers and they've used the course to renovate the property in front and get that extra $100,000, $200,000 in equity and then use those funds to fund the, you know, drawings, architectural, you know, plans or subdivision or whatever it is in what state, you know, there are obviously is a difference in timing. You guys know that better than me. But they're using the funds from the front to actually fund the development work at the back and start getting their marketing material together. And I think, you know, when I've seen that um, working for the, the student, it's it's really a, an impressive strategy. And that's kind of, you know, the fundamentals of what I wanted to show this evening is like, you know, where, where the money can be created. It's that first impressions, kitchen, bathroom, paint, stage it, you know, and, uh, it's it's getting that two dollars back from every one dollar but most suburbs don't do that you can't do that and so you really need to do the research um but i do have let me just pull up my other screen if i can i do have a um so one of the things that I um, show is a, a technique called the box in the back. And this is for more of a structural renovation. And the reason that, uh, and I'm going to try to play this, but uh, actually, I think I've even got the video down here. The reason I want to show you this, like the simple kind of structural renovation is John Hubbard, as I said, was the, the co-founder and, and uh, developer of the Ultimate Guide to Renovation. This is his property, and this is a solution that he took from the commercial property building industry and bought to the um, residential uh, property so that it was actually a whole lot cheaper to create this box on the back. Now, I just want to give you a little, I mean, this is, you know, the, the kind of blueprints that is in the course. So obviously you need to take these to an architect and get them done up, you know, especially but the prop type of property that this would suit is one where you've got to like three meters below the eaves 
usually the addition is around about seven to eight metres. And just to comply with council um, requirements of land, you probably need another eight metres out the back. So if you've got like 16 metres from the back of the house, this is where this box of the back uh, technique kind of um, sits in. And essentially what you're doing is you're taking you know, the old traditional Federation house and you are cutting off the back, the lean-to mm -hmm. in inevitably, and you're putting on this great 60 square metre room. So let me just see if I can play this video for you. It'd be nice if it works, hey. <laughs> And uh, let me know if this you can hear it it's just for a couple of uh, minutes. The benefits of sure. this type of extension are not only speed but cost. The box on the back. Now you may be familiar with a lean-to or skillion roof structure, and this is technically what this is. Made popular right up until the 1980s, this is a building method where a raked roof falls away from the back of the existing dwelling. You'll often find them on the back of Nana and Pop's houses, where the further you walk into the room, the more chance you have of hitting your head on the ceiling. But before you become concerned, let me say this. The technical name is where the similarity ends. These lean-tos that I'm going to show you don't look like that. So you can see that big um, slider door there, the stack of commercial door, a lot cheaper than you know French doors, for instance big glass panel rather than a window. Building products such as laminated beams and posse struts, our lean-to has a ceiling height of 2.7 metres or above. Now, this method was used in this case study and created a 60 metre square open plan room. It's typically seven metres deep and spans the full width of the existing dwelling, typically nine plus metres. This is a large open plan space, which also creates a canvas for large proportions in the kitchen. And the best bit is it doesn't look like a lean-to. At the sides of the structure, where on an old school lean-to, you could see... So you can see there, you know, this is when I talk about, you know, having the, the capability to kind of take it to the next level. This is the, the structural type of change. Those, um, using that commercial technique, Cheryl, it allows you to build within like three weeks that structure. And, you know, the cost is somewhere between like 90 and 110,000. And then the fit out is how much you want to spend on your butler's pantry and your gas and uh, and your kitchen. But, you know, to another 30 to 40 grand. And we even had a lot of our students use that for their home. So they'd been quoted $250,000, $300,000 to do an extensive, you know, uh, box on the back essentially and uh, this was you know a lot cheaper so uh, when I you know wanted to kind of share with you your um, developers you know some thoughts on how they could potentially do a cosmetic or a structural renovation this is the the type of um, renovation that uh, I think is really uh, you know clever and allows us to add that equity and with that equity, allow that leverage and the leapfrogging. Frogging. And in this instance, using that to help fund some of those development initial costs. So that's a that's essentially before I move on to the research. That's essentially uh, how I would uh, I would use that technique. So yeah, I might just stop sharing my screen for a moment and uh, see what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's a really um, it's a simple but really effective way of. Um, you know, expanding the space in there without having, you know, I mean, often these these homes do look a little bit run down at the back. It's probably the back bit where it's all sort of, you know, you've got the outhouse and everything else. But you can see there where you've chopped that off and opened up that whole space. And I can see how you just transform um, the, that whole space itself in that home and say if there was extra land at the back, there could be a whole lot of development that happens in, in the back of that that's, that's really clever. Um, but yes, I mean, I'd love, love to be able to see, um, you can tell you love your numbers and, and using, using data analysis as a tool to be able to identify one, you've been able to identify suburbs to focus on. And also yeah. then what sort of pricing that you're going to be able to, you know, what's value and what's not. Cool. Well, look, let me, um, first of all, I'm just going to jump into um, the Suburb Selector software just to show you how, from a buy and hold resi point of view, I would normally do an assessment for people. So I'm just yeah. going to take you through that and share my screen again. 
yeah. uh, share my screen. And do I have to press something? Yes, I do. Okay. So I just wanted to show you. So this is, uh, let me just pull it up. So this is my suburb selector software. And, you know, there's a whole methodology um, as to how I teach to do this. Let me just pull up a uh, map, for instance. So, you know, if I'm looking in Brisbane, for instance, and I, I do concentrate on the capital cities and on the major regionals. So I'm not kind of like no man's land out there. This is the dot map technique. Um, you know, I stole this from Medine Simmons, bless her, and uh, kind of put it on uh, put it on steroids. But what it allows me to do is every single month, um, and I teach people how to do this. So I, I don't uh, share these other than with my mentoring students, the the digital ones. But um, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at pricing pressure. So I'm looking at suburbs, for instance that have got all of these reds and oranges, reds being greater than 6%, oranges greater than 4 and they're pushing on to other suburbs. So reds, reds and pinks are pushing on to yellow. So, you know, Mount Gravatt, for instance, has done over 10 years, 4.67%. And, you know, Upper Mount Gravatt, Gravatt's, you know, done, what, 4%. We've got green down here. 2%. So you can, st you can start seeing this ripple effect. And essentially all I'm doing there is modeling the ripple effect. So I teach people how to find suburbs that are 2% and 1% difference in growth. Now, as a developer, because you're flipping quickly, you don't want to anticipate the next lot of capital growth potential. What you're really doing is you're looking at, you know, how you are going to be able to, to uh, look at um, the where there is already some indication that there's pressure because it's nice to have some mm. elevated kind of um, uh, growth, you know, to add on to your bottom line. So bear in mind this step has gone first. And then it's just about uh, any any happy area that you want me to have a look at, <laughs> Sydney, let's, for instance. Let's, let's go to Sydney. Yep, Sydney. Okay, so, you know, we're going to have to start at a higher purchase price, so maybe $1.5 million. Now, you're really happy to go 40% below that, for instance. You think you're a bit of a gun negotiator. You're happy to go 10% above that. So I'm talking about the median um, medium value. And you really would love to be within 15 k's of the CBD. So essentially what this does is it goes and gets all the information from the median data from SQM research. So you can see here, you know, there's a number of areas that are coming up that have got houses. Now, I happen to have a house in Darlington, but, you know, there's a, a few here that uh, that come up and you might choose one or two. So usually what I would do is I'd get those suburbs that have got the pricing pressure and now I've mm. put in a filter to say, well, what can I afford? So I find those ones and then I start clicking on them and then I just mm. take that data through. Now, as a low-risk investor, for me, it was really important to almost guarantee I had a rental market on demand. So I wanted to have at least 30% renters because that's, you know, 70% of people own their own home, 30% rent. So for me, there was a, a minimum criteria. I also didn't want to waste my time. So I wanted to make sure that there was enough sold per year. You know, I wanted to check out, <clears throat> obviously horrible here, the yield. And the other thing I was really interested in is I wanted to be able to make sure that there was actually some proof that there was some growth there in the past. So I'm really looking at, you know, this 10-year growth figure and thinking, well, how does that actually compare to the actual capital growth in the city? Not as great. You know, if we have a look at, you know, what the city was doing, you know, over the last 10 years, and I've been tracking this now for numerous years, Sydney's done, as of last month, 8.32%. So I'm looking mm. at this and I'm like, you know, do I really, does this really have it in it? But, you know, there might have been a property or a block that's come up. And then I just want to get down and understand who is in that suburb. So I want to understand through the census data, you know, what is the typical property? It's a two-bedroom house. Who's living there? Who's my target market? You know, mum, dad with kids. Well, but there's a high percentage of uni students. Young, you know, there's a train. I'm looking at things about, you know, the percentage of houses to units. So this then would raise a flag to me going, oh, maybe vacancy rates are high, but it's actually been... Um, uh, affected 
divided by the number of units there. So we look at vacancy rates at 4% because I'd normally set a 3% mark. So this is kind of like the standard da, 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 how things work. However, I have created an algorithm that excites me all the time. <laughs> and I was thinking about this today, which was how could I, if I was a developer, you know, who, who am I trying to sell to? And invariably the biggest market, the 70% of the market, is the owner occupiers. So I looked at this and I thought, well, if I was going to change my price points here and change the criteria, what would that look like? So I went through and I ran this, and I'm happy if there's if there's someone out there listening who would, who's got a price point and, uh, you know, a, a capital city or major regional you, you want me to run this for. But I ran this criteria for people wanting to buy between four hundred fifty and six hundred fifty thousand. I changed mm -hmm. the minimum rent to one percent because I don't care if there's more in occupiers in this area. You know, like breeds like, um, and I wanted to have the majority of the people own occupiers. So I set a top mm. percentage rent to forty five percent. I really don't care about the vacancy because I'm not selling. You know, I'm not uh, trying to rent it out. I'd like a house or a townhouse to be the typical property. I want to make sure that the market bears exactly what I'm trying to bring to it. So either a renovated house or, in your case, building a townhouse, for instance. I don't really care about the annual sales because if the property does come up, um, I'd really be interested in understanding how to do that. Um, I can see a question coming up around... Uh, yeah, when you trust. flip by these titles held under different trusts or under your name, what strategies would you utilise to minimise and optimise capital gains tax as a result of a flip? So maybe we can address that a little little bit after we've done done our calcul calculations. Sure. You just want to see the Excel spreadsheet, right? I do, I do <laughs> want to see I just want to see it in action. So essentially, um, you know, in this instance, I ran this earlier and just did a little formatting so you could see it. In this instance, you know, of that criteria across Australia's capital cities and uh, major regionals, Geelong and Newcastle, Wollongong and Ballarat and Bendigo, and Sunshine Coast and Gold Coast, only 147 suburbs meet what I'm after. And so then I get to the stage, I'm like, you know what, I'm not really interested in buying in Adelaide. I would prefer to buy in, you know, Brisbane, for instance. And so then all of a sudden I have, you know, the suburbs that come up and I'm looking at them I'm like public housing. If there's a large number there, you know, usually over 10 percent, I would say, let me just be aware where in the suburbs that are that is. And like I've got a I've, I've spent a lot of time with census um, in working out how to hack their design maps so that I could actually pull up the different uh, SA1 areas that allowed me to look at where in a suburb the renters wanted to live or conversely, mm -hmm. in your case, the owner occupier. So what streets yes. um, and how to stay away from where the housing commission potentially was. Percentage rented, so I'm interested in, you know, looking at maybe the lower numbers and seeing which ones had had more um, uh, owner occupiers in it. I'm just getting to understand, you know, the percentages of, you know, couples with kids or without kids, what's important. I also look at, you know, the number of houses and units and semis, but I then do a proportion of units to houses and semis. So if there's a large amount of units, it shows me that there had, and remember, this is 2016 data, but, you know, it would indicate there has been um, some development in that area. And that's when I would then go into the next lot of planning information using suburb trends, for instance, to go through and look at the planning mm -hmm. applications that come up. And then I've got, you know, percentage of semis and townhouses to houses. And the reason that this is important, so you've got CIHI 110, and that's because the typical property is a semi, but... The reason I've got this is that often what will happen if you've got, for instance, here and run corn, 41% of the uh, properties there are townhouses, it just gives me an indication that this median would be affected by the large amount of townhouses. And if, if I'm looking there for a $621,000 house, it's like got no chance because in actual fact the houses are selling for eight hundred dollars and the townhouses are selling for maybe six hundred, dollars and that's why we've got that. Um, and once mm. again, you know, I'm more interested in the one-year growth here. So where has there been a run? 
Um, I'm, I still want to keep up with the 10-year data. And then poor Brisbane. Mm. You know, Brisbane's done, up until December, it had done 2.3%. You know, it's had a bump up this year, 4.2%. So, you know, when we look at the rest of Australia, I, you know, guys aren't that interested in growth, but I, I, I'd rather put my money where there's some proven growth potential. Yeah. Um, and, uh, just just to pause pause there, I mean, I, I, I really, I mean, I see that you said um, you've looked at the one one year growth and and that's great, but that's, you know, we might have already reached our peak or whichever. So mm -hmm. I think even for developers, if, you know, we might be developing and building and might take all up about two years. 18 months yeah. to two years so if you can rely on a bit of capital capital growth particularly if um you're finding a lot more people wanting to buy once it's completed and yeah. as well and we're not getting as many off the plan sales depending on where where you are and if it's owner occupier as well so we still do want to be able to see some level of all right well you know, if, is, is is it a strong, yeah, a strong, because yeah. people, when they're buying, they also look, they're also looking at what the capital growth is going to be in that particular suburb. Yeah, and, and that's why understanding this demographic is so important. You know, this data, you know, when I'm looking at, for instance, getting really down to, well, mum, dad and kids, you know, what's the percentage of kids in primary school and secondary school compared to the rest of Australia when I can see that data in census, it gives me an indication of, you know, well, is it going to be beneficial to be near one of these schools as well? So let me, you know, create those territories in RP data so that the properties in those territories in that suburb are coming back as alerts for me. So at this... Um, I think the other thing here, you know, the stock market change, the the stock that's been on the market in the last 12 months, the change and in the last three months, just gives us an indication of how much of a run there is or, um, you know, where the market stands. Like I'm, I'm always trying to look at in, indicative yeah. numbers to give me an idea of well, where we're going next. And, and, you know, vacancy rates aren't that important here, but, you know, something over 3% in Brisbane is, is highly unusual. And, you know, when you start getting those kind of numbers, that's when you kind of start looking at it and thinking, well, maybe there's a large amount of units in this area. And if there isn't a large amount of units, i.e. none, you're like, oh, what's, what's been happening in this area? And that's when I'd go into SQM research and look at the yeah. month on month and just see if there's just been a couple of disparities or if it's actually a proven uh, pattern because we know data you know you have to be a bit of a detective and and uh, try to look in, into it and decipher what's going on so that's um that's one of the spreadsheets but I'm really happy if anyone is you know wants to have a look at um, any of these areas, I'm, I'm I'm happy to do some price points and some areas that, uh, you know, and run the algorithm just before hopefully not crash the computer, but show you how I, I do this. And so how, how often is this data um, updated or is this based off the 2016 data? So the census data is based off the 2016 yes. census. All of the other data except for the income data, so the income data is the latest ATO um, data that came out of the income um, for the area. Um, the rest mm -hmm. of the data is updated on the 21st of every month from SQM Research. I just buy the data right. off them and yeah. run this. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, there's, there's, some, there's a whole lot of stuff happening in here, but it goes to show, like, you know, how how you can be so methodical in what you and where you're choosing. Because I think that mm. that's, that's the thing that a lot of, um, whether it's investors or developers, we sort of struggle with because it's like we've got so many suburbs to choose from. Where yeah. are we going to be able to find growth? Where is it popular? Where, where can we expect future growth and demand as well? And, yeah. and not forgetting, I mean, particularly with development, you need to be able to look at, um, not only the data, but then when you're looking at the council or the area, what sort of infrastructure spend is is, is happening because that's another driver of growth there as well. So it's uh, what what I'm what I'm seeing from what you're doing, Jane, is that 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 process really driving around a process around how you are doing property, whatever it is, investing, renovating, developing. What is that process and do you have one um, and what it is that you're trying to achieve at the end, which is why you mentioned, you know, what are your goals and what is your why? 
that needs to be your guiding light as to what you're doing. Otherwise, you're basically in this state of constant ooh, ooh, opportunity here. Oh, ooh, we can do this Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, when, when I when I look at the people who have achieved exactly what they want and what they had set out to do, you know, the thing that I guess I kind of had this revelation maybe two years ago, you know, and a lot of people had asked me to do mentoring and I was kind of like, you know, if I could speak to the masses and affect change for many, I want to put my time and effort into that. And, you know, what then happened was I kind of, I had a look at um, the people who had been successful and what the characteristics were. And really, you know, there's often a, ch a time when, um, so I'm just, oh, there you go, not responding. And there's often a time where, you know, I'm just trying to understand what has held someone up. And, you know, I talk to people all the time and they will share their vision with me. And a lot of them, you know, and I will say I want five properties or I want ten properties. And as we know, like five properties in Lithgow and five properties in Turak are going to get you a whole different retirement. And so it just tells me they don't know what they want. And so it's my job then to kind of work out what what they're after and so by doing you know um by doing that what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to understand exactly you know where where they are um coming coming undone and so and i thought you know if i could mentor people i can actually just take them through the process because i can do property yes. but i'm still getting some resistance in in what was working for some people and what was not working for others and I thought you know there's got to be something else and so I was really trying to get into the mindset of who were those that were being successful and what I found was that the people who were very very clear on their vision mm. had 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 an advantage but sometimes it still fell down and you know last year I had um, two of my my mentoring students who were just not sitting well with you know and this is pre-covid not sitting well with you know jobs and decisions and past property investments and I, I just didn't have the capacity or understanding of how I could work out what was holding them back and it wasn't property because they had me on tap to try to assist them with all this process and so I found you know a methodology or a, um, yeah, a modality um, you know William, William White Clouds what kind of natural success work that really tapped into the mental stories that that people were doing and you know the what people were getting right and what people were getting wrong and what i found was that there was always something that was holding people back and so i thought i'm going to just map this out and i'll show you my little my mm. my little mind on this because i think it's really important um and it's, it's around knowledge and it's around action. And so, you know, there's people who have like, you know, I want to be a millionaire. I want to, I want to have a Ferrari. I want to have the beautiful girl on my arm. I, you know, I want, I want, I want. And really the interesting thing about that is a lot of them are coming from a position of a negative vision. I want to get away from something. So if we think about this, I've got my elastic band here. Mm. You've got this vision that you want. And then you've got this thing that you don't want. And what you're doing is you're just always trying to run away from it. And it's just pulling you back, right? So this is a negative vision a lot of people have. And I've run into so many people who, you know, they've done, you know, they've done NRAS and then they've done NDIS. And then we've been mm -hmm. buying in the US. Did you know if you can flip in New Zealand, there's no capital gains tax up until, you know, 2019. And there's all this stuff. And they're yes, action takers. Yes. And they don't see the vision the whole way through because they're actually running from something. And then we have these beautiful dreamers and they're the people that you meet and they're like, oh, did you do this course and are you in this Facebook group? And, you know, did you know that there's another course coming out and, and they're doing all the courses and they're empowering each other. But And they have this beautiful vision but they have no concept of their current reality where they are, the capacity or the resources that they need to get there. So there's actually this, like, gap that they can't jump over and they sit in, up here in the dreamers. Mm -hmm. We have the cynics 
And if anyone's a student of like the hero's journey, you'll know that, you know, there's a threshold guardian that's like, don't do that. When you borrow a million dollars, you'll never go back, which is what my dad told me. I'm like, oh my God, I've got like 3 million in debt. What's it going to think now? (laughs) Let's not talk about that. (laughs) Exactly. But I've got 10 million equity. Um, You know, it's, and so, but these people are often our friends and family and they actually care. Mm. They A lot of them aren't malicious. They're, they're the guy at work who goes, really, you're buying another house? Like, oh, you know, they're not really malicious. They just worry about us and we can't affect that. They take no action. They have no knowledge. They're just there giving you chatter and mm. unfortunately they actually pull a lot of people um, into their stories and they don't progress. And then we have these wonderful achievers. And these are the people that I, I just, you know, I just love working with. And, and I know there's a lot of you on the call, uh, on the webinar tonight. But, you know, they have this clarity of this vision and they understand it. They have an emotion. And, you know, the vision is not the number of properties. It's not, you know, $100,000 a year yeah. income. Their vision yeah. is I want to be able to, you know, walk down the street grab a coffee, take the kids to school, go to their sports carnival. I've got a passion project to have an online store or, or mm. you know, have a, a, a men's shed or give back to community. They actually have this whole sense of what life looks like. They have a connection mm. emotionally and visually to, to that end result. And then they have a very clear understanding of where they are now, their current reality. And to some extent, you know, this is like the the – treasure island with a treasure on it and this is the pirate ship you know they are they're putting grappling hooks into this and they're pulling it forward and it's not a negative vision they're moving away from they're very very clear a lot of people still have this tension down here which is the anchors of i'm not enough i'm not worthy you know um i have no capacity i'm from a poor family the rich man will never get to heaven you know all these stories that hold them back but you know the people who get it they're these achievers that are grappling hooked to their visions. And it's just a delight to see that. And I know, you know, I do a, like a, a, an initial visualisation session with, you know, my people and sometimes my my strategy calls and my mortgage clients as well. And we just go into a visualisation of what's it look like? And then we, we go, well, how many holidays are you having a year and where are you going and what are you eating and how much does this life cost you? And it's not $200,000 a year. It's like 60 grand a year. Okay, mm. well, you've got super, you've got one property. You probably only need this much to get to the next level. Like, let's not overcomplicate things. Yes, and I think um, you know I've got uh, I've got this I guess thought around that connection to the vision and and that why or you know what's really truly important to you. That's mm. the thing that's going to be the difference between success or not. And you know I've got. I created this kind of calculator. I'm going to show you wherever I put it. But I've got a, a calculator that I made that um, just allows me to to, to do the clear as soon as I find it. Where did you go? But you're right when you say, you know, we often, I mean, I I think we're Um, sort of ingrained to a certain extent, Jane, that when people, when people are asking, oh, you know, what's your property goal? And people are like, oh, I, um, 10 properties, 10 properties are what, what I want. And you're you're absolutely right when you're going, but 10 properties, how much is that? What does that mean in terms of the numbers? Like, you know, if it's, but from a per annum what income let's talk about income as opposed to the number of properties or or equity or what you know what that value looks like because exactly like you said you know it's it's 10 10 properties are they 5 million each or is it you know 300,000 each that's and and that's very different so starting starting up to understand okay I want to replace my income what are the strategies that will allow me to get there quicker and then exactly them. I love that this is another and I think, calculator you know, and no this is now this is a calculator I made myself so you're gonna to have to go to my website to get it um investorschoice.com.au portfolio hyphen calculator but I did this because a lot of people just don't know um how many properties you actually need you know setting setting the kind of like 
this is my expectation. And I'm assuming, you know, this is a very simple, it's complicated because the reversal capital growth <laughs> calculation, but it's a simple way to just go, if I had these much properties and then I sold them and I put the money in the bank and I got a certain rental return, mm. or a certain return on money in the bank, you know, how many properties do I really need? And so, you know, I think it kind of gives a little bit of clarity that it says, okay, you only need three. You want $60,000, you know, in today's dollars, in 15 years' time, that's like $75,000 based on 1.5% inflation. And you just play around with this. And that's just, that was the simplest way I could help people just get an idea of, okay, so you kind of need to be buying this much now, three properties, you know, 500000 each. And I think, you know, to me, it was that was really the idea of, um, you know, how how you could start working on what you needed to understand um, as to the next step. Understand your vision mm -hmm. to start with and then understand how much you really need because most people overestimate how much they need to have a, a simple life. And, you know, my husband, you know, we bought properties between 2001 and 2006 and we stopped he gave up work at 40 he paints portraits and paintings for you know the, the archibald We've had you know the opportunity i might just stop that screen share but the opportunity to you know have like nathan lyons the um, incredible um bowler come to this studio and just you know talk about him you know listen to him and and you know well, why are you doing this? He said, I've always wanted to play for Australia. It was my dream. It was my vision. It was my why. And, you know, when I first got my bag of green, I slept with it under my pillow for two weeks. You know, that's how much it meant to me. And, you know, having that connection, I think, yes. you know, when I look at the people who have been successful, they set the vision and it was a realistic vision of really how much did you really need to live. Mm, yeah. And and I think I know we've, we've sort of... Um, T tailed off into sort of the the goal setting but I think it's so important that like I said we're we're going to these property um and we're learning about property I think we we need to understand that we we can't lose track of why we're doing this because it is so easy to be pulled in various directions mm. and like I said because there's so many opportunities there and like I said what's the flavor of the month and yes you know and then there's the there's co-living and all of that but it's sort of going right where, where do I want to go? And it's not about the the number of Ferraris. It's not about the fifty million dollars. And, and if that's your goal, I mean that's that's absolutely yeah. fine. But I mean, for a lot of us, it's like you said, that feeling and that vision of I just want to be able to have the choice to do exactly. Things. And so, and some people, you know, I'm, I'm working with a doctor at the moment, and you know, she was tragically widowed with four little girls between the age of six and 11 and she went from the you know 100 hour a week doctor to like how am I going to run the house and have financially look after my family and you know her goal was within three years to go to three days a week and create a, um, a education for you know burnout doctors and we've been able to achieve that within 12 months for her. So, you know, it's just around having that real clear goal. And the goal is usually not a number of properties and it's yeah. usually not the income that you need. It's what you really want to be doing with your life. And I think, you know, if I could really share anything, it's around just, you know, having and having an impact, having a legacy and being able to understand, you know, why you're doing it. And, you know, I'm putting together like an abundance coalition of like-minded people who have an opportunity to invest profitably with purpose, be conscious capitalists, but, you know, have the capacity to bring their genius to the, the residential market and go, well, where is the need, you know, and, and what can we do? And I've seen so many people in your group, you know, doing, you know, uh, housing for homeless or you know co-living for for those over 50 for instance have been through a divorce you know there's so many at in need who just need the basics in life which is structure and and, and um shelter. Absolutely. absolutely um we i love to be able to i know we've got some questions here and anyone that's that's here please comment if you have any questions about renovations or any of the 
the the cool tools you, you've seen at the moment, Jane. I can't. I can only imagine how many hours you've put into that. But the fact is that you're putting together um, uh, uh, solutions to problems that people were having, which was assessing the data and, and trying to make make a quick assessment. But well, we might as well um, might as well uh, attend to this yeah. question here in terms of how your um, ownership and trust and all of that. How have you? For yourself, done that because obviously you've you've implemented a, a predominantly buy and hold strategy. Well, can I put the big disclaimer in now and say I'm not an accountant or a financial planner? <laughs> All this is based on my experience and those <laughs> yeah, of the people I've worked with. But you know, the thing is, I've never flipped, and I've never, um, I never produced um, a, an asset that had the purpose of doing that. I did assess one, um, you know. A, after we had had quite an experience in, you know, having a team together and we can knew, knew that we could, you know, activate them and and create the vision of what we were after. Um, we looked at a unit and it was actually in, um, it was in the Edgecliff, views of the city, you know, the bedrooms who had the views and it was a, quite an easy move to, you know, with the external walls to actually just put the plumbing and making the kitchen and the lounge room with the view of the city and we done some, had done something similar with our Bondi Beach um, beachfront unit. But we were really clear on the numbers and, you know, they wanted, in the end, they wanted $5,000 more than our numbers showed our FISO and so we walked away. So that was the closest we ever got to doing a flip. Um, so I've never flipped. I've never had the fancy trust structures for flipping so that you can, you know, go under a company trust. I do have properties in trusts and in uh, company structures for asset protection and income uh, disbursement. But, uh, yeah, I can't give you advice on that because I've never done it. Yeah, okay. And then for your properties that you've bought and held, have they been in company structures or personal names? Yeah, I, you know, once again, early 2000s, there was a lot of fear <laughs> and there was a, you know, you need to have a hybrid discretionary trust with the company acting as trustee and, you know, the, the trust takes uh, out the the title and the property and the person takes out the debt and therefore if you're sued all you own is debt and then you know 2009 the family courts kind of just went straight through that when a lot of people were hiding assets and not paying uh, child maintenance and you know your name's on a piece of paper somewhere your name's on a piece of paper so and we know for, as mortgage brokers you know they're looking at everything so you can't hide uh you know uh those kind of numbers there is tax advantages of having corporate and company tax. I get that. There is, cap, you know, capital gains tax implications of um, selling a property at a profit. I get that too. It'd be nice if we could all hold our properties till we retire and pay at a, a lower tax rate, but that's not, uh, you know, logical for everyone. So, you yeah, know, obviously just speak to your financial planner or your accountant and uh, and speak to them with what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And every every situation is going to be different, mm -hmm. and especially what and, and and your family structure and how you want to be able to disperse income and all of that as well. So, absolutely understand that. So, I believe I didn't even realize it, it, time flies when you're having fun. We're way mm -hmm. past nine o'clock now, and but that's been been absolutely fantastic. It's been fascinating to see again, like um, as part of your community and and how you've been coaching your your students around uh, sort of finding properties I, I like I said when just before our call started I was looking at the spreadsheets going oh <laughs> and it was like the I love it was, I, I actually um developed that spreadsheet uh it shows you how how wonky I was I had um brain surgery two years ago and I was recovering and I thought oh what if what if that like five to 15 hours worth of research people can't do quickly i need to put this down into an algorithm and so whilst i was in hospital i engaged this guy and we were working together around the clock oh Lucky. my goodness and, and yeah so that's how i developed that wow that's fantastic jane thank you um for anyone that is I, i'd love to be able to point them towards some of your sure. you know your training your resources and everything um janeslacksmith.com.au uh but also in particular um your property success is that the course that is free but it's a donation only. Can we yeah, so it, so essentially I've got a, a club, Your Property Success Club, and it used to be like $97 a month and, 
you get a Q&A call and all the archive of the eight years of monthly calls, which most people go back and listen to, which astounds me, and um, 10 videos. And, you know, I teach the dot map and I show, you know, some of the pricing disparity in renovation. So there's 10, you know, 40-minute videos or so, and I take you through that census how to get down to the yeah. streets <clears throat> where own occupiers are. That's um, if you go to janeslacksmith.com.au, go down to the bottom, you make a donation to Kids Helpline, be it $25, be it $500, be it $20 a month. Um, instead of paying the $97 a month, I'll give you access to the Your Property Success Club, get access to my uh, Facebook group and those Q&A calls, the archives and the videos as well. So we're so close. We, we set an aim last year of um, making $10,000. We did it in 14 days and now we're on to the next $20,000. So we're at 16642 So getting closer. Fan fantastic. What a what a great cause. Like you said, you know, we're, we're, we're you're using our powers for good um, and we're giving back, particularly over COVID as well. Like you said, a lot of people are getting impacted by that. So um, hop on to Jane's, Jane's page. Thank you, Jane. That was amazing. And Pleasure. everyone else that joined thank us today, um, thank you for, for your time being with us. I look forward to seeing you on our next session of the Business of Property. If you're wanting to um, watch any of our previous sort of episodes, we are on YouTube. We are starting to load up all our previous episodes as well. So um, keep an eye out, uh, YouTube page, the Business of Property, if you type it in. So take care. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.